Hi, everyone. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hi. Good, af Good afternoon, Professor Bodhi, Professor Gasman, and all uh, professors Hello. from Peter Manopo, Indonesia. Fantastic, Peter. Thank you. Enrico, uh, you know that you have to sing at the end, eh? You know it, eh? From dottore, dottore, no? You're in, uh, you, you are prepared to it, eh? <laughs> This is the only reason why I joined, you know? <laughs> Corrado, good to see you. Uh, so ciao, Pascal. A very pleasure for me <laughs> to see you again. Paul. Hello. Enk. Ciao, Enk. Yeah, hello. Ciao, Enk. <laughs> ciao, ciao. <laughs> Hi, this is Anna Borovecki. Can you hear me all? Yeah, I can hear you. Thank you. Hi, Enrico. Hi. Hello, Anna. Very nice to see you all. <laughs> I'm not sure I can see you. I'm not awake yet. It's five in the morning here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry, Jeff. Uh, <laughs> I love you. Hello. We were also yet at five in the morning. Up. <laughs> Hello. Wow. Hello. This is Leila from Turkey, Ankara. Uh, I'm very pleased to be with you here. Uh, I uh, hi everyone. I've graduated graduated uh, in 2010 from Erasmus Mundus Master of Bioethics program. I'm very pleased to see you and to be with you here. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thanks. <clears throat> Ciao, Chris. Hello. Chris. <laughs> nice to see you again. Hello, everybody. Hello. Uh -huh. and... Okay. So... Zoom keeps on asking me to do all sorts of activities. Hello, Norbert. Nice to see you. Hi, Pascal. Can you hear me, Pascal? Perfect. Okay, yeah. that's fine. Uh, I have to find. Oh, yeah, I can. I can switch the microphone off here because that will be necessary, I guess. Huh? <coughs> uh, yeah. Okay. So who's there? Hi, Paul. Hello. <laughs> On Hank is also Our there. Show. Hello. <laughs> Welcome from Berlin, everybody. <laughs> mm -hmm. Nice to see you as well, David. Two Davids. Yeah. Uh -huh. Hi, David. Hello. Hello, nice to see you all. Hello, David. Hello, from Luxembourg. Hello Paul. Hello. <laughs> Thank you. Hello. So it is uh, 12 o'clock now, but we will wait two more minutes so uh, that everyone is able to, to enter. Hi, Peter. How are you going? Oh, I'm good. And how about you? Remember me. We did the master together. 
I'm yeah, sorry. yeah, yeah. I have the uh, I have the picture. Uh, <laughs> I prepare if if possible. Uh, I can share the screen later on about our photo when okay. the graduation. Yeah. <laughs> and okay. how about the pandemic situation in your country? Oh, it's difficult huh? here in France. We are not confined, but uh, we have not locked down, but um, yes, it's difficult. Huh? And how about the vaccination? Already completed? It's starting, but it's very slow. Huh? It's very slow. So I think we won't see the effects till the end of the, till the summer, I think. It's, it's a little oh, bit. Okay. Uh, but everyone uh, will get the shot uh, free, uh, free of yeah, charge? For free, yeah, it's for free. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay, I think it's time to start now. Um, first of all, good morning, but maybe I should say uh, good afternoon or good evening or even good night, depending on the, uh, the time zone you are living in. Uh, so, but... A very warm welcome to all of you to this celebration session for the 20th anniversary of the Master of Bioethics program of the KU Leuven. My name is Chris Gasmans. Uh, I am head of the Center for Biomedical Ethics and Law, and I will share this session. I think this is an important moment in the history of the Master program because it is a moment to look back to 20 years of activities, but also it is a good moment to express our gratitude for all the good things that happened during these uh, 20 years in the field of bioethics at our university and in our collaborating universities. Today, we will express that attitude, uh, that gratitude by listening to the stories of people who were involved in this program, at one moment or another moment are strongly involved or less strong involved, but we will hear the founding fathers, we will hear the uh, academic policy level people, the, the, the dean, the, the vice rector, etc. We will of course also hear the alumni and the current students and of course also representatives of the current academic staff, the program director, as well as lecturers. So we have a very uh, strict and tight uh, time schedule, and therefore I suggest that we start immediately. But first I have two uh, small practical announcements. The first one is to inform you that the session will be recorded. And the second one, that uh, I, would last, I would ask you to mute yourself because that is the most um, comfortable way, I think, for everyone to follow uh, the session. So let us start with uh, the first uh, presenter, and that is uh, Professor Pascal Bory, who is for a long time already the program director of the Master of Bioethics but he is currently also the chair of the Department of Public Health and Primary Care at the Faculty of Medicine, and of course also professor of uh, medical ethics at the Center for Biomedical Ethics and Law. So I give the floor to uh, Pascal. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chris. Uh, welcome, everyone. Welcome uh, to our Vice Rector, to Dean, uh, to uh, her Excellency, the Ambassador, uh, to many alumni, um, students, uh, colleagues involved in teaching. It's really, it's truly an important moment for the program. Uh, it's nice to bring everyone together. And, and, and during the many emails I received over the last uh, days and weeks, I, I think that for many alumni, it is an important moment as well to, to bring and connect uh, again with uh, the alma mater in, uh, in Leuven. Well, I will try to give a short overview and, and uh, in, in 10 minutes of 20 years of bioethics, uh, master of bioethics, which is of course way too short, um, but I hope it gives uh, some, uh, some nice, brings back some nice uh, memories. Um, first of all, going back to the 
start of the program, I tried to look into the archive that we have of our master. And um, I don't have, uh, have to say, the minutes of the first uh, meetings in which the whole program started. But uh, I can find one of those, uh, for example, minutes from 1999, referring to preliminary meetings already in 1998, um, taking place at the Fondazione Lanza in, in Italy. Uh, in Padova, where the plans were made for an inter-university program. And it's really, I think, very important to, to see that this is, was already, at that time, uh, really uh, innovative. It wasn't, uh, at that time, very common to have international, uh, common, jointly developed uh, program. And I think here, I would like already to stress the importance of some of the people already as well present today in designing this program. Uh, in particular, Professor Henk ten Haver, uh, I think we, which we can truly say that has been the conceptual father of this program, um, professor at the University of Nijmegen at that time, that brought together colleagues from different universities, uh, in particular from Leuven, uh, Professor Schotsmans, from Italy, Professor uh, Viafora that is here, as well, Professor Diego Gracia from Madrid, that quickly then uh, I mean, left as well. Uh, the program was replaced. Uh, Professor or um, uh, Dr. Pegoraro, uh, that was involved in the program, and that was really uh, the innovative design of a program that was a part-time program with uh, monthly uh, training courses uh, of uh, four weeks in a row at Nijmegen, Madrid, Leuven, and Padova. This is coming from the minutes from that meeting. So it isn't exactly 20 years that the program started, if you go back to the first class, but it is exactly 20 years that the program started in Leuven. If you look to the first class, we have to go back to the 6th of March, 2000. Um, and here you have the program of that day. And I think that our students would probably not agree to have this kind of class schedules today. Because at that time, they started at 9 o'clock, continued until 9.30 in the evening, non-stop, and that five days on a row, and even with Friday afternoon, an exam on what they had seen during that week. I don't think that our students' representatives today would uh, accept that, and I think they would come um, uh, and rebel against this kind of schedule. The first class in Leuven took place on the 5th of March, 2001, precisely 20 years ago, with a lecture of Professor Toon Vadovelde uh, uh, on, uh, in the course on methods of applied ethics. I entered in the program a little bit later. I joined in 2002 and, and was, uh, was really an honor to work with uh, these different people here, Henk de Have, Paul Scotsmans that I mentioned already, uh, Renzo Pegoraro, uh, Daniela Gober, that uh, left us uh, already, um, uh, and uh, Professor Stella reiter And That is our as well in the kind of the design that was made at that time. It was a jointly developed uh, uh, design that some of you will recognize. This is the first picture that I have from the first group of participants that was taken in 2003. Uh, and you can see some of the people that are here today, Pos Hotsmans, Henk ten Have, uh, and I'm not sure if Katrin and Ines, that were the people coordinating the program, I'm not sure if they were able uh, to join. Um, and here as well, an earlier version of myself. As well, Professor Stella reiter was was uh, participated in those early years, a professor at the University of Basel. This is a picture of an alumnus meeting in 2008, um, taken at uh, the World Association of Bioethics Conference in uh, Rijeka. And now we are 20 years later. And there's a picture taken at the start of this uh, academic year. And during these 20 years, if you just take a few numbers, well, you can see we grown uh, into a program a community of 283 alumni um, from 76 different countries. I think this is enormous. And I think uh, we have 
alumni uh, everywhere around the world. This is an enormous community of alumni. And we have at this moment our 18th generation of students. Of course, the program changed somewhat over the time. We left after three editions, the part-time edition, and moved to 10 editions of a program as an Erasmus Mundus. And that has been an important shift. Um, and we had a change of coordination at that time. Hank ten Hage moved to the UNESCO. We had Paul Schotsmans taking over the program directorship of the program. The coordination of the program moved somewhat from uh, Nijmegen to Leuven, uh, bit by bit. Um, the program was still inter-university with the first semester in Leuven, a second one, a second trimester in Nijmegen and in Padova. Um, and our students were really a community of uh, students moving from one university to the other, uh, often staying in the same house, in the same uh, place during that uh, period. 2016 was an important shift um because at that time we had to uh, it was the end of our uh, well maybe i can say show you some pictures first of the erasmus mundus period before i move to the next step many colleagues during that time uh, were really uh, shaping the program in particular wim deckers who was present here as well from the uh, corrado via fora uh, norbert steinkamp uh, my direct colleague in in planning and organizing um the, the program and of course uh, our um, two of the people here Chantal de Keersmaker, Simone Naber that were involved in the daily organization of the program together with the colleague uh, our colleague Enrico Furlan who promised me to sing a song uh, Dottore Dottore at the end of the session. 2016 was an important year our Era, the Erasmus Mundus structure that had uh, had for 10 years a lot of benefits for us in uh, at the level of international recognition, at the level of fellowships, opportunities for students and staff. This contract ended and made that we had to make an important policy choice for the future. Um, and at the time, the, we had uh, the uh, KU Leuven wanted to go on with the program. Uh, I think Nijmegen and Padova uh, had a little bit more, uh, well, internal issues as well. Like, how can we organize and, and manage in a different context this program? And I'm really grateful to the uh, to the dean, uh, the vice deans of uh, the the vice rector that during this period gave us a lot of credibility, confidence, support uh, to continue uh, with the program. I would like to thank as well the student administration, the admissions office, uh, the educational support office that helps us redesign, rethink the program and give it as well an, a, new, uh, a new future and orientation. For students, if you would like to enter in the program today, well, this would be the program today. A foundations course, a law and healthcare, a clinical bioethics training course, a seminar, uh, an end of life uh, related course, public health ethics, human genetics, ethics and law in biomedical research, of course, the research component, and as well, quite a lot of electives. I would like to mention as well the importance of our fund, Roger Burggraaf. Um, this is really important to give uh, opportunities to students to follow the program. We have fellowships that we are trying to give, and that's only possible as well thanks to the, the financial support that we received in the past as well from many alumni. And I would like as well uh, to remind you that uh, uh, for future generations uh, that your support is more than welcome. Of course, the program is not possible without many of the colleagues involved at our Center for Biomedical Ethics and Law as well as many clinical colleagues as well that are now integrated in giving uh, clinical bioethics case discussions. Our program changed a lot over time, but there are many stable factors. Uh, focus on bioethics instead of applied ethics more ger generally, and a European approach, an advanced master level, an important focus on research, an international audience, an interdisciplinary public and a lot of small case, uh, small group discussions around different cases, all elements that were present already since 
the early days. We have now an important network of alumni world, world, worldwide working in different roles, and we really want to strengthen that more. We realize that we need to do more about that, and I think uh, some recent alumni as well present today would like the initiative, uh, take the initiative to strengthen that network. Um, one way that we initiated recently is KU Leuven Connect, which is an online community of uh, uh, forum for connecting alumni from different uh, uh, generations. If you are not registered yet, please register uh, yourself. If you have troubles registering, let us know and we will help you connect. I come here at the end. We built, I would say, on solid rocks of the past. This is a picture we took in Venice at, during a visit of one of our meetings. I think this is um, a future, uh, I mean, looking forward picture. I think um, we have the back, we are building on our history, but we look forward for the future for many more years. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Bori, for this uh, rich overview already. And I suppose that many of what you have said will come back also in the, in, in the coming uh, presentations. So um, let us continue with the second uh, story. And that is the, the story that will be told by um, Professor uh, Herregers, Paul Herregers, who is the Dean of the Faculty of uh, medicine. So, Professor Herregs, the floor is yours. Dear colleagues, dear friends of the program of bioethics, I am really thrilled that I see that people got out of bed in the United States at four o'clock at night. Uh, I saw this in the chat just to join us here. This is really amazing and this means that there's a very strong community among the alumni, which is very, very, very fantastic. First of all, I would like to congratulate the Master of Bioethics for its 20th anniversary and also congratulate all of you who contributed to its success, the founders, the professors, but also the students and the alumni because it's only in a vibrant but respectful community that the program on bioethics finds fertile ground. I was asked to talk about the program of bioethics in the Faculty of Medicine, and that's only, of course, a small part. In the Faculty of Medicine, this is, of course, important, but it's also important that it is in a good connection, in interaction with other programs of ethics throughout all the universities here in Leuven, but also worldwide. In Leuven, of course, we have this uh, tradition of personalism, which uh, all alumni, of course, will know and which will undoubtedly be reminded by Professor Schotsmans, I think, in one of his latest talks today. And of course, this makes it very important that we also try to apply this to our, uh, to our work, to our uh, training, to our education in the Faculty of Medicine. And why is it important? Because we all deal whatever the program, the educational program, that are, is taken in this, in this faculty, it can be medicine, dentistry, biomedical sciences, but also management of uh, healthcare and so on. That we all work for the vulnerable person, the vulnerable patient. And the patient is vulnerable, not only from the physical, but also from the psychological, the social and the spiritual point of view. So it's important to think, okay, what can we offer to this patient to make his or her goals for the future uh, that can be reached then? So this is kind of ethics for the individual patient, which is important for each healthcare provider, whatever his or her role is. A second thing is, of course, there are more and more technical possibilities. Life can be prolonged for a, many, uh, for a long time but the question is is this all affordable what is the cost for society and with cost i don't only mean money but also cost of efforts and of uh, side effects of what we can do not only for society but also for healthcare for the individual patient his or her family and friends because it's only in this community that the real value can be 
shown. This brings me to the a new buzzword uh, from the latest year, which is value-based healthcare. And if it's used in literature, usually it's, it is about money. So value, yeah, the value is brought at a certain cost. So is it worth the money? But I think it's broader than that because value-based healthcare is not only about money, it's also about ethical, spiritual, and moral values. What can we bring to the individual, to the society, to the next of kin of this patient? That brings me to the organization of our faculty and the role of bioethics in that, and especially, of course, this master of bioethics. In each educational program in our faculty, we have a course in bioethics, which is integrated in each program. And this is quite remarkable. But we think this is important because bioethics is not something separate. It should be integrated in everything we do, in caring for the patient, in developing technologies, and so on. But of course, it's also important to have a number of people that are really well versed in this bioethical thinking and can guide us and can can support us, can be our sparing partners for all the professionals in healthcare and healthcare development. So, and therefore, that is the final aim of this Master of Bioethics to give people more background so that we can rely on their judgment and have them as sparing partners. Last but not least, I would also like to thank the people involved in this program because they are valued participants in the faculty board for many years. And then I see, of course, Paul Scotsmans, who was a member of the faculty board for more than a decade, I think. And now, since last year, also Pascal Bori joined our board so that we have always this strong connection. And this helps also the people with a background in bioethics to influence the faculty policy, but also to take the lead, for example, in the research ethics for master papers that uh, is very important in these last years. And this uh, has been taken up initially by Paul Scotsman. It's now brought to a very high level by Pascal Bori. And I really would like to thank them uh, in, in the name of the faculty. So thank you for this uh, excellent program that we fully support and will support also in the future. I hope we see each other in another, uh, I would not say 20 years, but 10 years, eh, because 30 years is also a nice uh, time to celebrate. And I hope you enjoy the rest of this program and keep in touch with all the other alumni. So keep it a vibrant, but respectful community. Thank you for all. Thank you, Professor Herregis, for these uh, supporting uh, words and for the all round support that you give us uh, or that you give to bioethics here in the faculty and in the university. Um, the next uh, speaker is Hankton Have, and Professor Hankton Have is uh, Professor Emeritus at the Center for Healthcare Ethics at the at Duquesne University in Pittsburgh in USA. But most for, for now, of course, he can be called the uh, founding father of the Master of Bioethics program. And therefore, we are very happy that he accepted our invitation to talk about 20 years of the European Master of Bioethics. Professor Ten Hove, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, please thank you. Chris and, and Pascal, thank you very much for the uh, opportunity to reflect on the uh, establishment and evolution of the master program. Um, I think it is, uh, let me see whether I can share the PowerPoint. Uh, I think it is important that, uh, uh, as Pascal already uh, referred to, that we started with a particular perception what would be necessary in the field of bioethics, not only to articulate better what is a European perspective in distinction to the mainstream bioethics perspective that is quite Anglo-Saxon orientated, but also to show that even in a within a European perspective, 
there are significant differences of opinion. Uh, so we wanted to, 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 to engage the students in a kind of um, experience in different places in Europe. And that's why we moved initially in the first period from uh, a one month periods in different universities in uh, Northern Europe and in Southern, Southern Europe. And you could say, well, they're important that you can really experience in real life that bioethics is not uh, the same everywhere. The, the challenges are not the same and the perspectives are not the same. And maybe it's also true for differences between uh, in within regions themselves that the way uh, bioethics issues are approached in the Netherlands is not the same uh, as in Belgium. There are, of course, many uh, similarities, but there are also important differences. And what was striking also for us when we started the European Master is the attractiveness, pro probable attractiveness of the program. We started with a first class of 15 students from 11 different countries. And you say, well, the majority of them, six, still from Europe, but also from uh, areas of the world that were not so involved in a bioethical discussion at that time. It was also clear that there is not, there is an interdisciplinary mix of students. Most of them are physicians, but also representatives with different disciplinary backgrounds. And I think that is also important to be aware of that uh, there is this interdisciplinary uh, background in bioethics that can be very positive because people uh, present perspectives from their, their, not only their different cultural background, religious background, but also disciplinary background. Now, the initiative actually was, <coughs> uh, uh, was launched from a particular background. And I think there are two important backgrounds, one in teaching and one in research. We already had started in Nijmegen with an annual weekly bioethics seminar. And that was also attracting a group of students from many other countries. And in that seminar, we worked together with the other initiators of this uh, master, uh, Pas Godsmans and Diego Gracia, and we published together also a book uh, on European perspectives in bioethics as a result of this cooperation in uh, teaching. Another type of cooperation was in research. <coughs> we had a uh, European project focused on palliative care ethics that involved participants from several European countries, for example, Belgium and Spain, and uh, Diego Garcia and Pascal Gottsman were also involved in this research effort. And as a result, we also published several books. Uh, and one book is uh, The Ethics of Palliative Care. So there was already experience with cooperation in teaching and ethics when we, uh, when we discussed the possibility of uh, expanding this into a broader educational effort. <coughs> and in fact, the University in Nijmegen, like the University in Leuven also, was very interested in this idea. They wanted to have more international cooperation. So they funded the first meetings of the team. They also funded the first class and the second class so that we can offer, we could offer uh, fellowships to uh, some of the students. And there is also the question, of course, why was this initiative taken? And I think there were three uh, explanations for an answers to this question. One is related to the evolution of ethics in healthcare. The second is that there was increasing awareness in the 90s of different approaches in bioethics. And then also in the 90s, there was increasing international exchange and cooperation. So let me explain this, this somewhat further. So this is a slide that I showed in the, one of the first classes of the first uh, edition of the master. And say so also it, it discussed the evolution of 
uh, ethics in healthcare, as it was also reflected in different uh, terminology, from medical ethics to healthcare ethics to bioethics, expanding the scope of bioethics and the issues, the number of issues that are important. And today, I would add the fourth stage, global bioethics, uh, which brings the bioethical debate to a more worldwide level and also includes global as a more broader framework, not only mainstream bioethics framework of principalism, but a broader set of principles, those and virtues that are important for everybody in, on the planet. So this is a kind of evolution that happened since the start of bioethics in discussions in the 1970s until 2000, when there was more tension for global bioethics. And you can see this in the, the number of issues that were important in publications, the literature and the debate. And it's also reflected, I see it reflected in my own publications. In the 90s, the tension was primarily focused on issues like biomedical research, euthanasia, genetic screening, palliative care, and reproductive medicine. Uh, and those issues are still important today. But in, since, the, since the, the millennium, the new millennium, you can see that there is a broader range of issues, cultural diversity, disaster bioethics, environmental ethical issues, biodiversity, for example, but also more attention for human rights, for global justice, for sustainability and vulnerability. So there is a much broader agenda of bioethical issues today than there used to be in the 90s. So this evolution was is some part of an explanation why we brought together perspectives and students and scholars from so many different countries in the area of bioethics. And it is related to the second explanation, that is that we have become much more aware of differences in approaches. In the, from the 70s to the 90s, uh, mainstream bioethics was primarily dominated by the, 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 the approaches of principalism, the four basic principles of bioethics formulated in, by Beecham and Childers. And, but that approach became increasingly criticized in the 90s and many different approaches emerged to narrative ethics, hermeneutic ethics. And there was also more attention for differences between the Anglo-Saxon approaches and the continental European approaches. And <clears throat> that was reflected in several initiatives to, to, to reflect more on European uh, the European perspective, the establishment of a European society, the establishment of a special journal. And they indicate that in a European context, ethics is not only a pragmatic tool, but it's related to philosophy, to a broader reflective context uh, of religion, theology, philosophy, anthropology, but also history. Uh, and that you can see that also in the the background of the initiators, the four initiators of the master program, the, the, the three of them had a background in medicine, but not only, they were also educated in philosophy, in history, in theology, and in anthropology. 